Mm -hmm. Great. And I believe we are live. Fantastic. Um, well, welcome everybody again to a, another guest artist talk with Z Festival. Um, today we have uh, Jennifer Jolly here with us, and I believe she has a special way of introducing herself that she perhaps learned from her Lincoln Center presentation. I have no pressure to do it or not, but um, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, feel free to introduce yourself however you like. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Jolly. Y'all can call me Jen Jolly. It's my Twitter handle. Um, my uh, pronouns are she, her, and um, I identify as a self-described Asian. So I'm half white, half Asian, Korean. So I have a Korean mother and probably a therapist on retainer because of that. Um, currently, I am wearing... Um, red lipstick and I'm wearing a flower dress that I haven't worn for like four months because when the pandemic hit, I was like, whatever, but today is special. And um, currently I'm in my studio, which is in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, I have a keyboard over here, a speaker, a cat bed or a cat bassinet. So it's like studio slash cat hangout room slash workout room if I feel inspired to do so. So that is me. Um, nice to see you all. And for those who are joining us on the YouTubes, um, what I was going to talk to you today is something that I've learned since grad school and something that I bring up to, um, all of my students, whether they're like high schoolers or graduate students. And I think it's something that's actually very important to talk about, uh, in these times because they have been a time and, um, Basically, these are two questions that I asked myself as a composer. Um, and the way this got started was when I was in graduate school, um, my professor, Joel Hoffman, who is now Professor Emeritus at the Cincinnati Conservatory, College Conservatory of Music. And he's like, let's all get in a circle. And I feel like we have some kind of virtual hang right now, you know, since we are from all over. And he's like, let's answer two questions within our group. And these are two questions that you should ask yourself. So. The first question is, why do you compose? And I think for those who are not composers, we're all creators, right? So it's like, why do you, why do you create things? Why do you perform your music? And I think that's like a very uh, important question to ask all of us since we're all creators. And the second one is, who do you compose for? Or again, if you're not a composer, which I'd argue that everybody is like creative or composing in some degree, form or another, um, you just have to figure out who your audience is. So I want you to think about those two questions. I will adapt them right now. Why do you create and who do you create for? And just think about it. This is actually kind of a harder question than you realize, especially if you've never thought about that before. Um, for those who are joining us on Zoom, I would encourage you to maybe put your answers in the chat. And uh, I will say that what would normally would happen is that, like if we'd be in a circle, I give you some time to think about it, although that might be like awkward time on the interwebs or whatnot. And then we go around and share them. So I will give you an example while you're thinking about this question, because I've had many times to think about <laughs> these questions and I still ask myself these questions. So uh, the first question is, why do I create? And I create because I exist in that way. And I've learned over time that um, I actually do like composing. Um, granted, I was a little stuck earlier. I'd say around March, my brain was like, what is going on? I probably didn't feel safe. I probably was worried about my fundamental needs um, and the realization of creating was like high on that hierarchy of needs. But um, I know that I do love composing. Um, I'm a creator and that's how I exist. So that's my simple answer to this question right now. And I might have a different spin on this, especially in COVID times. Um, and then the second question, which I've been thinking about kind of like all the time is like, who do I create for? And I would say that I create for myself. That's definitely okay. Um, especially when I think of like, who do I compose for? Yes, I compose for myself because I, I would like to like my own music that doesn't happen all the time, right? When we're sketching something out, I'm like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. So 
I, I create for myself. I create for uh, my friends, my colleagues, um, and I especially create for my performers. I feel like um, one of the things I love about being a composer is collaborating with other people. And I also believe that creativity does not happen in a vacuum or this idea of like genius, which I really hate that word, like just does not happen in a vacuum whatsoever. So I always love feedback. I always love collaboration. So think about it. I will start us off in the chat. First question, let's do one question at a time. Why do you create? And I would say that you could either put it in the chat. You're welcome to just say it aloud. I think we'll have a lot of things in common. I also know that um, your videos are rendering right now, right? They are, okay. So think, I create, so Peter says, I create to remember stories. I love that. That's interesting, kind of like, do you, do you think it's more of like a replay in your brain or do you want like a kind of a spin on it or do you want to own your story? Um, because yeah. I feel like there's a little bit of creativity there. That's interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I, I feel like sometimes it's just like pure documentation so I don't forget. And then sometimes it's like, I don't know, there's something in whether it's something that happened in my life or something that I heard that feels mm -hmm. significant, but I'm not really sure what it is. Um, and so you write in order to try to get to that thing and then have that be documented through the exploration of finding it. That's awesome. And I, I think, well, what I like about that is it, in a way you're like true to that moment. You know what I mean? You write kind of like how you experience or how you feel. And I think that, is, is really important and special. Okay, so uh, Andrew says, I create to express my experience more accurately, more accurately than I could any other way. I completely feel that, especially because I feel like I express myself too, but as a composer, like, like that's the best way I can do it, right? I have words, but sometimes they don't come out of my word, my, my mouth hole very well. Um, see uh do, 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 do. and now now that's all coming in uh max said for the gratification of bringing something new into the world i love that again this is why i actually say that all humans are creators because we we may not be composers but we're humans man we we put meanings on everything that's creative right and you're bringing something new into the world that is ah that is what we do and i love that uh, Dale says, it's the best way I know how to process and understand myself and the world around me. Absolutely. And I saw your cat, I think. So props on that. Love it. Um, Laura says, I cr create not for an end product, but for the process. Love that too. I enjoy seeing things form in the moment as an experience, preferably shared with other people. That's really cool. And yeah, that's again, why I love this collaboration because like, even though we put down or we composers put down a final bar line, it's like, is it really done yet? Can people hear it? You know, is my MIDI realization the real thing? I seriously hope not. All right, Corey, um, why don't you, um, Corey, would you feel comfortable reading yours or do you want me to read it? You can do a thumbs up or a that. Okay, Thumbs sorry. Up. Yeah, need... go ahead and read. Sure. I'll just read it verbatim. As an individual and a society, we have a lot to be angry about right now. People on all sides are shouting without hearing the other side and empathizing. A lot of hate-filled and unfounded rhetoric from all points of the political and cultural spectrum is being weaponized. Anger can be channeled into an extremely beneficial tool, though. It has the power to change the system, to drive people to revolutionize our voices and actions as another tool to fight against injustice and strife. Maybe given enough time, the ambient volume of our own life's noise can be overcome, and we can understand and overcome together. I'm very interested in the relationship between one's inner self and mental state and the environment surrounding the individual. This usually takes the form of unique aspects of the human condition, and I reflect this in the communication that results from an audience connecting with a performer who is attempting to interpret the composer's score using their own artistic decisions. 
Yeah, thank you for that. And I would say, yeah, especially in this time and now, and I'm glad you answered this question, how you're feeling now in the present time. And this is why I say, I always ask myself, like, why do I compose or why do I create? Because we are different. We're even different than we were yesterday, right? So, uh, and I have been thinking about this a lot because of the times. And it sounds like, you know, there is a lot of anger going on. You're probably feeling anger. We're feeling a whole bunch of emotions. Let me tell you what, and I'll, I'll address that a little bit later, but um, I think it's it's kind of healthy if, if like, this is your reason why you create and this is the reason why you compose. Like, it's good to acknowledge that. And yeah, it can inspire you to like try to express yourself and try to deal with it. I think that's, that's awesome and very healthy. Um, so Laura, um, Laura, do you want to say, uh, what you, why you create? Oh, she's um, out. Well, is that me or, um, it just says Laura. Yes. Well, I'll just, one. it's, it's okay. Me. Um, yeah, it's similar to yours. Sorry. There are two of us, <clears throat> but yeah, um, I'm a composer, so I like, playing around with sounds and making things out of sounds which yeah. yeah there's a balance to be had between just letting the sounds be something and then making them into something that makes sense but also like balancing that with other things that may or may not exist yet and just seeing okay well if I do that then what does it mean for this other thing and how do I navigate that that's great. So like, it almost sounds like a curiosity, right? And a learning yeah. process. So you compose to, to, to experiment, you expose mm. to like create and, and you bring a curiosity to your creations, which I think is awesome. And I still hope I retain that myself. Um, Shoshana wrote like to have art in the current moment and further art being relevant to current society. Awesome. Alana said, I create because I'm, I've tried not creating and I don't like the person I am when I'm not creating girl. I like, I feel you. That was me too. Like, I remember when I first started teaching full-time my day job, as I say, I'm a professor person. So that's, that's my day job. And I literally did not have time to write music my first year. And it sucked. Like, I was like, Oh, I don't know. Like, you know, like maybe I'll find some time or I might be okay. And yeah, I would say I also didn't like the person when I'm not creating, like, I feel like it's in our nature to like make something right. Um, I probably also created way too many cookies that year of my teaching. Like, I feel like there's an outlet someplace, whether it's in music or something else. Um, and I think actually um, that being said in the pandemic, a lot of my friends and I granted, I have like a lot of creative friends, but even those who are like, don't identify as creators, I think we've all been creating. We're trying to find something to do, like whether it be like bread baking or like growing a start. Yeah, right. Like I have a growing a starter or like I've seen a lot of gardeners like I should. I was thinking like maybe this is time to garden, but I've literally killed a cactus before. So and uh, it's like ridiculously hot in Texas right now. Um, but I just, yeah, I, 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 I very much, very much relate to that. Um, Julian says, because it feels good and makes people feel good within good. We feel echoed resonated through art. Yes. Oh, that is definitely very touching. Um, and very true. Awesome. Um, yeah. Shannon said, I just have a need to, if I don't, I don't feel like myself. Yes. I totally get that. Um, and Kyle says, I've never really had a choice. It's always been natural. I've always had trouble expressing myself with words, but never with art. Um, actually, Kyle, what do you mean when you say you don't have a choice? Like, do you feel like you have to like express yourself? Um, yeah, it's, I, I don't think about it. And like, I, I'm not gonna show you my room, but there's times if I'm not composing or if I'm not, uh, um practicing or whatever there's time I'm just like making things my whole room is just like DIY <laughs> um because I just look at I find ways to I don't know just try I like making things better I don't know I like puzzles and I've never really known why um but it's it just kind of just cycled and I 
I was that kid who grew up playing with Legos and that's why I'm a composer. <laughs> That's awesome. I actually, um, I'm starting like a new DIY, like electronics class. I wish me luck because I've never been one to like experiment with electronics, but definitely with sounds, I may have that. Um, but I'm, I'm noticing like a commonality with all of us. Uh, we're definitely all creators and then we're meant to compose and are, are meant to create. And um, I know that in this time, it's been stifled a little bit, right? I feel like, um, or at least our traditional ways or what we feel like are comfortable ways of creating things in this environment has been a little limiting and stifled. And I think our brains are like, what, what's going on? How do we evaluate yourself? How do we exist? How do we create? How do we do what makes us happy and what makes other people happy, right? Um, so I, I'm, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I would say that if I were to like re-answer my question, especially during COVID times, um, I would say that it is also an outlet for me to express myself because, um, I too have been angry. I too have been actually very anxious. I, I've actually, I am diagnosed with anxiety, but now it's like, especially everything is compounded, even, even like normal things. So I'd like, I, last week I was wrapping up teaching an online like interlock and camp thing. And I had to take so many hardcore naps. So, so exhausted. Everything is taking so much energy because, you know, we miss that physical contact as an introvert. I feel like on zoom, I have to like emote, I have to say something. I have to like, you know, tame down the memes, which were adorable that my, my kids had, but, um, it's just, there's just a lot of energy I think that's being used in this time. And I feel like even though my brain didn't feel like creating and I knew that's what would make me happy, I just didn't feel comfortable. I was scared. And now I feel like I'm in a mental place where it's okay to create. I miss creating. Um, and also it helped me deal with kind of grief a little bit. I think we've all been going through grief. Um, by the way, Laura, with um, talking about origami stuff, I did that as a child. I even like took an eight and a half by 11. That's impressive. Wow. That's awesome. Um, and that's awesome you did it too, because that's like, Thank again, you. creation, right? Like we well, got to do that. I didn't design it, but it took me like, you don't want to know how many hours this took. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing it took a very, very, very long time. <laughs> um, I mean, I like first did a test fold just to like make sure I could actually fold the sequence, but I think it's like, um, yeah, there is a crease pattern. It's from works of Satoshi Kamiya. Um, sorry, Corey Brodak was saying there is, I could probably find a crease pattern for that, but I did it from the diagrams because I'm not that good at crease patterns, but yes. Also, this is like a huge sheet of paper. So yay. Amazing. Yeah. The, that makes me so happy that, yeah, we're finding ways to create because like, um, I know we've all had to adjust for creating for music, right? I think you all had just had this 48 hour project and you all had to do everything right. So this actually falls into my second question when we'd have the room. And again, this came from Jill Hoffman. Um, who do you create for? Right? So there was the why. And now who do you do? Who's your audience? And let's be real. My audience has changed a little bit. Um, I've had performances canceled and or postponed, um, which is a little bit of a bummer, I have to admit, because um, that's that's what brings me joy in composing right is like working with other people um going to live performances um and also like i wrote something and i have an idea of what it's going to sound like but i don't exactly know which is also exciting um slightly nerve-wracking sometimes but um i'm a little bummed and so i there's a part of me that's like well i wrote specifically for these people for this ensemble for the audience and that audiences of now does not exist. So then what do you do, right? So in times of COVID, I'm like, all right, well, who's our new audience? And do we have a new audience? And how does this change our way of creating? Uh, if we have performances there on YouTube or Facebook Live or something like that, or they're like pre-recorded or fake lived. So like, 
Um, this year, I did not ask my students this question because I was like, all right, I'm going to teach them some basics in computer music. I also want them to hear some really weird shit because they need to, right? Because even the, even some of them were like, I can't hear, I can't hear a pitch. And I'm like, do you think the composer wanted you to hear a pitch? You know, a lot, a lot of thinking faces. So, um, I was like, but they need to have their music performed, even though it's it's mixed media and it's fixed media. So what do you do, right? So uh, something I've never done with students before is um, I actually had them thinking of, of a visual to go along with their fixed media pieces because we kind of need a visual, right? Our audience and our platforms have changed a little bit. So I had them do a live concert on YouTube. You can do live, pre-recorded live things. And what was kind of fun was um, it had the big word premiere on it. So like the kids felt like it was an actual premiere and then we all got to watch it at the same time. So back to the question, who do you create for? Who is your audience? And I would say it's okay to think of it either way. You can think of like, who's always been your audience or who's your audience now? Who are you writing for now? And again, for me now, I'm writing for myself because I need it. Like I need a way to process my emotions, to process my grief. And also I need to listen to my own music. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, you know, is it self-serving? I'm like, I don't know. I think we need everything we can to feel good in this moment and to feel like ourselves as best as we can. So think about that question. Uh, you're welcome to put it in the chat. Um, who is your audience? I mean, do you, do you all think that we are reaching out to more people through the internet? Okay, Corey says, I mostly write for myself, but also for my friends and family who have always been very supportive of my work. If others beyond them like my music, it is just an added bonus. Absolutely, bravo. I'm gonna add a reaction because I like writing for my friends and family. Although for like my students, I sometimes say that sometimes my parents are not part of my audience because I've written a couple of sound art things that were, let's say, not appropriate for children and i guess not appropriate for my dad oh well all pieces are different <laughs> the allegorical mother yeah yeah all right laura says uh, i guess it's twofold i need to be at least somewhat happy with it agreed <laughs> but it's also whoever wants to listen i don't try to gear it toward any one group of people although i'm writing for a specific person to play it then it ends up being for them as well um, i might play a tiny tiny bit of devil's advocate for you i would say that you you do know you do know who you're writing for um, you just need to dig a tiny tiny bit deeper um because like i know that not everybody's gonna like listen to my music or take the time. And um, something I just realized or thought of or been thinking about is uh, you know, the way we listen to music online through YouTube is way different than like getting dressed up and sitting in a concert and listening to music. Um, or even like uh, those who have like record players, like the whole concept of like listening to an album and then flipping it over and then listening to the rest of it. You know what I'm saying? Like the medium has really changed um whether we've had COVID or not um I know for me personally with regards to audience like that's changed for me because like I'm used to writing for big ensembles sometimes like I've um I, I'm now known for writing wood ensemble music or as I've affectionately called myself a band whore but that's just where my gigs are but um they literally can't perform right now cannot um they're still waiting on things a lot of my band director friends don't even know what they're doing for the fall and my performers are part of my audience and we don't even know what the audience is right so um i've been in these discussions um with some of my colleagues we're part of this thing called the um creative uh the creative repertoire initiative because our audience has changed. We don't like our audience, especially in schools will be based on your last name or a student's last name and they all show up based on the last name. It doesn't mean like 
they don't care if you're a tuba player and a piccolo player and that's all you got that day you know we're just trying to stay safe and so it's like how do you even write music for that right my audience has changed okay julian wrote um myself and my friends historically and still today rock on more recently any strangers on the internet who might like a day brightened right there we do have a little bit more reach in this regard um if i write more personal pieces for people who've been in situations like mine look at that like writing for your people that's actually another way of doing that rock on julian kyle says myself however everything going on now has altered why i write for myself it used to be writing for the sake of writing creative sound curiosity now it's become about emotional processing and self-reflection uh, yeah, though I haven't entirely figured out my audience, legit, I've always thought to myself, what would the listener want? If I'm stuck at a creative crossroads, I'll always ask what the listener would appreciate. That's, that's awesome. And I think it's very important to think of your listener. Absolutely. Uh, Peter wrote, mostly myself and people who can hear me practicing, totally. <laughs> when I open the windows on a hot day, um, I'm a little jealous because like my landlord shut my windows because it gets so dusty and windy here because there are literal tumbleweeds y'all i'm not a texan and i'm seeing them it's a real thing it's not made up okay i like audiences not knowing if there is a performance or if you're just having a moment to yourself in public i kind of like that too um i love i love that approach um Dale wrote, the simple answer for me is that my audience is myself along with whoever feels like looking in. Ooh, that's a great way. I might steal that when I explain this. Yeah, on that relationship between myself and the music, but I think my ideal audience adds another why to my practice. I create as an attempt to find not necessarily an audience, but a shared creative community. Not sure I found that yet, but I'm looking, I guess. Oh, I, I feel that so hardcore because like, I feel like um, I'm not like always on a quest to find my people, but certainly when I was younger, I was like, who is my audience? Who are my friends? Like who, who's my support group, right? And especially now, um, I think this, this may turn a little dark, but during COVID, like I've had some friends who are like, you know who your true friends are <laughs> based on the pandemic, like how we're dealing with stress or like, I don't know about you. I've like reached out to family more often um, which is odd for me. I won't go into the details, uh, but like, at least I'm like reaching out and trying to find commonality. You know what I mean? So, um, really, really looking inward and into that. And I would say that, um, even COVID or not, our audiences will change over time because we change over time. Um, yeah. Also side note to, to Julian, tumbleweeds are real. They like break up. It just gets so windy here the things break off and they tumble. And in fact, I, um, I will say that Lubbock is the stereotype of what people think of Texas. Dry, windy, stupid hot, tumbleweeds. And flat, it's really flat here. Anyway, um, Alana said, um, at the moment, I think our audiences are mostly competent internet users. Yeah, you are not wrong. Uh, probably many of whom are starved for live events. Um, yes, um, I think that the attention for internet performances are shorter, particularly because of internet burnout. Um, yeah, Alana, oh my God, so true. Um, I would say that like, I, I don't know if my parents, I'm not picking on them. I don't know if they've um, checked out live performances. I mean, I think they can work Netflix, that's fine, but that's like different. Um, I am so starved for live performances. Um, normally at this time I would be teaching at Interlochen and my, um, Social media is like, hey, psst, guess what you did a year ago? Here's a picture of a live concert. Cool, huh? Uh, and they're like, relive the memories. And I'm like, no, I can't. Or what did you do five years ago? You went to a live concert. What did you do a year ago? You went to a live concert. I'm like, I know. Um, and I would agree that Zoom burnout is a thing. I know we're all on Zoom right now and thank you, but that's the best we can do, right? Like to stay safe somewhat sane. Um, so uh, I do think that the concerts have been shorter. Um, some have not been, but I think it's just like, we can only do screen so much in a day. Um, and again, like, I think that's changed. So um, any other comments with regards to um, how else it's changed or you all are in agreement, like it's more YouTube. Um, they're free performances, am I correct? Yeah, uh, go ahead, Andrew. 
Um, the the one I'm grappling with is the lack of uh, geographic uh, centricity, which I think is good um, in terms of like New York City taking over the world when it comes to classical music sometimes. Um, but also like I have a strong loyalty to Denver. I'm a Denver born person and I'm all like, I want to help out my city. But like um, that's not where like th that's not evident in, in online performances that level of uh, geographic relevance. Mm -hmm. um, I've also noticed too, I've also noticed that, um, I didn't know this was a thing. I'd always like, if you're gonna put a time for something, like we were so used to just assuming it was in our time zone or assuming in the time zone that we were at. And now you're starting to see the slash time zones where you'll see like Eastern daylight time and Pacific daylight time. And then people who, let's say, hail from mountain time, which is actually not me. Even if I drive straight up, it's Colorado. And Colorado is beautiful. I would be like, yes, I love Colorado. I miss mountains. I'm from LA. I miss mountains. So um, yeah, so you're noticing a lot of the slash times. And I agree with you. I think it's less like New York centric. Um, but, you know, we still have like some other areas. But again, I think like to put on these performances, it takes a lot of not just time, right? Just a lot of energy to do it. And especially if you want a good quality video, which you all have had way more experience than me um, since your videos are rendering as I speak, probably because it takes a really long time. Um, but yeah, like I just think uh, the reach is better. And that's something I hope we keep with our audiences. I hope that we still have that reach apparent. Um, you know, right. the... Oh, go ahead. Go Sorry, ahead. The, the time zone thing has been particularly interesting for me because, um, yeah, I've been, I've still had, well, I still had classes in London while I was here. So my teacher was like, oh yeah, do you want like the 1030 slot? And I'm like, actually, can I like not do that? Cause that's like 530 my time. So like, can we not? And he was like, oh yeah, um, I'll just swap you with the next person. And then you can be at like 130 instead. Yeah. And I would say that even so, even though maybe you as the audience in your class, you yourself hasn't changed, but you have because of the time zones. And that's something we've had to be very cognizant of, of like of our reach and who our audience is. Um, I see Corey, uh, Corey just wrote, there's a larger group of artists that are doing things pro bono for each other or for different types of compensation because we are all trying to lift each other up through these times. Now more than ever, making sure artists still have a voice is important. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, I think being heard is is important. And again, that's actually figuring out your audience, like who wants to hear you? Uh, again, I don't think it's self-serving. I think this is why we exist, right? You were thinking like, um, you were all thinking of, well, why do I create? I think we all need an audience. We need our people. We all need a support group and that's changing. Or we're also reaching out more people, but maybe not at the same time. You know, synchronously, it's a little bit more difficult um, maybe they can all watch a YouTube later. That's totally fine. But um, it has definitely changed a lot. Um, how many of you, um, and you don't have to like, maybe you can do like a show of hands thing. Um, how many of you are kind of grieving about who our audience is and how that's changing? And I know I personally am, because like I said, I can't even like, I can't write for my large ensembles right now. I also wrote like a vocal trio for women voices, treble voices. It was supposed to be performed in New York City and is about, uh, for lack of a better word, lady astronauts. And you know, singing is like out. Man, you talk about something that's primal. You literally can't do it. Um, I am grieving about that. Like, um, you know, you hear about like singing in choirs is just supposed to be like very like nourishing for you. Um, oh my goodness, my singing colleagues cannot sing right now. And it sucks. And even the thought of like, not even writing for voice, like I could, I could theoretically write for voice right now, right? But then does it exist without it? So I did see a few thumbs up about grieving about uh, actually instrumentation, right? Um, so that I've thought a lot about too. Um, yes, I could create some electronic things. Actually I will. 
Um, I got to get on that once I get my speaker. I have a, I have a singer friend, Carrie Henneman Shaw, who wants, who commissioned me to write for um, a Stargazer synthesizer and herself, which I think is cool. I don't know. I think she could actually perform it because it's just going to be her and her Stargazer synth. So that's badass. But like something like a choir, um, operas, oratorios, like my trio, you all might like my trio, like, and I think it could probably be performed, but then like to what, like, Maybe we can do what Korean baseball does and do the stuffed animals, which I think is really cute. And I think the MLB should mirror that, although I don't think they should have a season. That's just me. Um, yep. Right. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So I saw a few thumbs up with instrumentation grieving. Do any of you all want to share what exactly you're missing? You don't have to. I can keep talking. Yeah, Julian. Yeah, tell me what you miss. Well, my main thing is conducting. At least I was going to start like a master's in it and I was doing it through undergrad and the gap year after, but that's like dead right now. <laughs> like it is actually close to impossible. Well, it's like not possible to do like orchestra, right? You can do like strings maybe and percussion. So you could do like Bartok's music for strings, percussion, and Celesta, but that's like the greatest you can really go in this time. Um, the orchestra in my university just like is at a loss for what to do, right? And um, the wind band of Jasmine were like straight up canceled. So, but really I miss, you know, very on a basic level, just having a lot of people in a room and all working together towards one project because, I mean, there's plenty of good conductable music too for like less than 20 people. But even just yeah. like the aesthetic of like all my friends in the room, because throughout my experiences as an undergrad, like the orchestras I've conducted have been like mostly my friends. So it's very much a social thing in addition to a sonic thing, just missing the orchestra aesthetic. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I had a colleague who, who does like a big band and she was literally crying. She's like, I miss my band. I miss my bandmates. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Corey, you have your hand up. I feel like I'm in class. Um, <laughs> I, I also have a, a choir piece that has been sort of sitting without any performance as well. So choir is really hard, but I think any large group, um, for instance, I wrote a horn octet in December that originally was going to get played in the spring and then was postponed and then it was going to be played at IHS in August and then that was canceled and now I think we're hoping for the spring for that. But yeah, it's any larger ensemble really is, is very difficult to get performed now because there's a lot of online collaboration going on right now, which helps with yeah. small ensembles, but getting together a large group over that is really difficult. Yeah, um, Laura, I see you wrote something in the chat. Did you wanna add something? And then we'll get to Alexa next. Yeah, it's basically that. Um, so I've had a string quartet premiere that was moved over by a year and then a bunch of saxophone piano performances have been moved not by a year but by an indeterminate amount and they're supposed mm -hmm. to be happening in the fall but like who knows um so i actually have a performance in september that's still supposed to be happening but it's in Finland. So that yeah. is like a whole thing. Question and mark? Also, like, yeah. I... Yeah. Well, actually, Finland's doing pretty well and they're still planning to have it. But like socially distancing everyone and limiting how many people can come. And I have to quarantine for two weeks. Yeah, you um, do. And I'm supposed to be starting a doctorate in the fall in London. But like, my supervisor basically just said, first, let's see if you even like get to London and then we'll see like how to proceed from there. So, yeah, I actually have a, a former student who's supposed to be starting a Mac master's program at Stony Brook and I'm like really excited for them. Uh, mm. But they're like, like, how do you even? Uh, Alexa, yeah, what do you have to share? Yeah, I'm so I'm a composer, but my primary instrument is flute. But actually, I'm most missing choir. Um, I had a choir piece, and it's like a huge choir piece. So like not something that anybody really wants to sing. But my my university choir was supposed to sing it, and um, it was going to be like my first like 
premiere by like a an ensemble that was like actually learning the music um and combined on top of that um i just finished my undergrad i graduated in the spring and we so we um had spring break and then just never came back and my spring break was spent on choir tour um halfway across the world and then we all came back had to go into quarantine and then just never saw each other again and so like my heart is aching for my choir people. We had the most amazing tour. We really bonded for the first time and then never got to see each other again. So I'm just like, I need choir. Yeah, and, and even closure. And I'm seeing that, so like, was it Alana? You all are even missing the timbre of the out of tune soprano. Now I like, I used to sing in choir. Like if the soprano is out of tune, like everybody else goes down with them, right? Like there's actually so hard to be a soprano. But if you're thinking about like the physics of sound, like you you need, and like, isn't that, isn't that fascinating? We're like, we will, we miss these things. We miss all sorts of timbres. Like, <laughs> if, yeah. if, you, if you tune like, just intonation in t- in just intonation you will go flat yeah but we miss that right we're, we're even missing we're missing like the opportunity to 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 like sing in whatever tunings we want we just can't do it we can't get together we can't even experience well what is it like like um on your on your tour alexa like did you like what kind of buildings are you singing in right like yeah we we're invite, we were the first American choir to be invited to sing at Word Feast Festival in South Africa. And we were singing at, we sung at Nelson Mandela's Cathedral and we sung, we sung on top of Table Mountain and we sung in this amazing grand concert hall with this other incredible choir from halfway around the world. Um, and like discovered that we had both sung the same piece at a reception. So we were out in the courtyard under the stars singing mm-hmm. together with them. And that was the last time we got to sing together. Yeah. So I'm going to throw in a tiny, I wouldn't call it a wrench, maybe like a thought with going along with like how our audiences have changed is. Have any of you thought about maybe, um, do, you, do you think that your pieces, now that you've written for a specific audience that may not exist for a while, right? I do, I do have some faith that we will be able to perform again in the same capacities. I really do. I'm hoping for a vaccine. I hope that everybody masks up. And if Texas can require people to mask up, my goodness, I think maybe we could turn this around. But um, in the meantime, since we don't know when we're going to get our audiences back or our performers back or the type of music we're writing for them, um, have you all thought about maybe like, is there a way to rework your pieces so that they fit those smaller ensembles or maybe change up the instrumentation? So like, um, I can't believe I'm saying this. Let's say you wrote a sax quartet, which could be a super spreader because you're like blowing in or maybe flute quartet, which uh, I'm so sorry if you play flute, that is especially a super spreading instrument. I'm, I'm, I know, no, I like, when you said flute, I'm like, oh my goodness, CBDNA is like releasing a study. Like they partially released it when they're like, um, flute is especially like not great at that. Um, but have you thought about like reworking some things? If it like, if you had like a woodwind quintet to like to strings, just because like, what have you thought of? Have you, have you thought that that was even an option? Okay, so Laura, Laura said, um, I did have a piece that I was asked to adapt to an online concert format. Yeah, how did you do that? What was your process? I mean, honestly, it it was just a shorter version of the same piece. Um, and I sent them, like, I guess the pianist recorded her part first and sent it to the saxophone player so that mm-hmm. they could, like, sync it up. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, do you think, did it turn out okay? Did you think yeah. you missed some kind of communication or, like, everything yeah, was well, fine? I mean, I would have, I would have done you know the usual tweaking and um feedback thing if it had been a normal situation which it wasn't and that's just what it is but Mm -hmm. i think it worked out yeah yeah cool i know for me personally um 
because there is this issue with um, ensembles, like in colleges, like they're coming back and they still have to have these classes. Like that's a whole other different thing I, I do not want to touch. Like sometimes this can be in person or they're going to be like, again, a different audience or a different ensemble. And a lot of us composers, um, specifically when Not ensemble, we were like, we were like, um, we need to adjust our instrumentation, but also just to an instrumentation that we don't know what's gonna happen. And there, I think it's a little bit different than let's say an open instrumentation piece. So I'm thinking like a couple of Louis Andreessen's pieces where like they're meant to be like whoever comes and does it. Um, and I noticed that some of my composer friends are having a really hard time with that. They're like, it is so hard to take, you know, the essence of, um, well, I'll ask you guys, when you write music, you think of color. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't write music, again, we're still all creators. You think about color. Yeah. Articulation, how you're going to do a phrase, like what's in the phrase. Um, and I think a lot of my colleagues have been, um, have been really frustrated. They think it's so difficult to like rework a former piece. And I feel like also their identity is attached to what decisions they make. So a lot of vegan composer I've learned over the years is actually just decision-making, which is why when somebody's like, what restaurant do you want to eat at? I'm like food. And they're like, no, no, really. And I'm like, no, but food and I'm hungry. And they're like, but what do you want? I'm like, I don't care. I'm hungry. I'm mentally tired because I've made all these musical decisions. Like that, like, just give me something that like I can eat and digest and like. So um, yeah, so I, I, I feel like a lot of our identity is placed not only in just like making musical decisions, but it's like color. I feel like there's such an identity with composers to, to just for color. And so a lot of my friends are like, this is so difficult. This is one of the most difficult things. Um, and obviously when it comes to like those color choices, it's not like they're just like, I just want food. And as long as it tastes nice, like there was a very specific ask for the color choices. Like I specifically wanted pho for breakfast because it is a breakfast food and that's what I want now. And it's actually going to be very difficult for me to switch over to something like eggs, which I may not like, although eggs are delicious, but I get, I respect those who don't like them. So um, what I was going to tell you all is I think there's a little bit of a grieving process there. And I don't mean to be dramatic because it's like, are there people grieving? Have people died? Are people sick? Yes. And I would say that's like grieving with like all capital letters. Is losing an instrument choice grieving in that regard? No, but I am hurting a tiny bit on the inside. And I think that's what's been making lives a little bit difficult. Um, and I just, you know, um, how do you feel about that? Like we talked about grieving like our ensembles, right? Our bands, um, our friends. Um, how many of you, uh, do you feel like that there is a loss with your instrumental choices or even like with that? Or maybe you haven't experienced that. I don't know. Yeah, go for it, Dale. I'm I feel like I'm in a kind of strange place with that because in a way, like I was already kind of like going through a process of rethinking the way that I make music and the way that I like create and put out into the world. Um, and I was thinking a lot of just like trying to, cause, cause uh, a lot of what I've been doing over the past few years has been like very minimal, like composing for other people just because like the way that my life was going, like I didn't get as many opportunities to do that. Uh, so I was thinking like, I really needed to reconnect with my own musicianship and like my own like making music for myself and then putting it out there like as like a self thing. And and like part of me, even though I was like losing all these other opportunities, like I finally had this huge like orchestral premiere that was supposed to happen, not huge, but like decent sized orchestral premiere that was supposed to happen in, in May that got pushed back. But like part of me was like, okay, this is okay. This is fine because I'm going to be uh, switching into this new mode of music making and exploring like uh, recording and like digital uh, spaces and all of that. And I would, kept on convincing myself that I was excited and it was all good. But at the same time, I haven't actually done any of that yet. So 
Uh, I would I would yeah. say at the same time, like you trans you in a way transitioned. You like thought about it, um, and it didn't seem like. Um, and props to you. Like it doesn't it doesn't seem like you're trying to cling on to something that is just very amorphous right now. Um, but yeah, no, like it sounds like you had to adjust for now, right? Um, and I, I, I do think that writing a small orchestra piece is a big deal. There are a lot more moving parts. Um, and I'll confess to all of you all, I didn't write my first orchestra piece till I was 27 because I'm like, I have to be a good orchestrator. I have to, I have to do color, right? Like my identity, I felt like as a composer was through my color choices. Um, so congrats. And um, I, I, I'm sure your premiere will happen. We just don't know when, and it's just what it is. And yeah, um, and again, I might I might push. Again, it's America. You all can decide what you want to do. But um, you know, maybe you can even adjust that. Like it took you a while, and maybe you can reformat it to something that's playable now, or not. You know, I don't know what your contract says, but um, oh, there's no contract. So that's fun, but uh, not to get into that, but like we are talking okay. about uh, having it redone, not redone, but um, performed in December if we can. Cause I, I'm in Connecticut and we're like, like on the mend compared to a lot of other states. So hopefully, well, yeah, I'm sorry. No, uh, it's what it is. What can I do about it? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. I mean, I am raging and I, <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I, you know, I get a little active there, um, but, you know, we're doing the best we can. Um, Seamus, you said you were already getting into open instrumentation scores. Um, awesome. Um, I would say that, um, what have you been looking at? Because I can help some other people. Um, well, have? I can talk a little bit <clears throat> about what I'm doing for ZFest. I'm sort of yes. taking a graphic score that I made a few years ago, but readapting it and um, making the instructions for how to interpret it less specific and making it bigger. Um, and then we're doing like a non-synchronous thing where we all make our own interpretations of it and then layer them on top of each other. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. That's awesome. And I love that you're like leaning into that. You know what I'm saying? Because like I, I think um, with my composer friends who are like, how do you do it? Like, I, I'm just like, look, um, and I try to say it as gently as possible because again, we're already angry. I think we're already frustrated. We're already like stressed the F out um, where I'm like, there's still some musical decisions you can make, right? Uh, by the way, um, who said the, uh, I think it was also you, Seamus, instructions for performance on how to find a restaurant. Yeah, that because it sounds like, you said about the about color being a restaurant. Well, it's like, what if I want performers to find their own restaurant, but I want to give them very specific instructions about like what method they should use to find a restaurant. That's been several of my most recent stuff like last year. That, that's awesome. And I would also say that it sounds like buffets aren't safe right now. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, Laura, you say you have um, a lot of score cleanup projects. Yes, I feel you actually. Um, I found a score that was gross <laughs> on my end. I was like, what is, what did I do with the thick low part? Um, yeah, I, I love it in a way. It's like, um, I don't want to say shifting priorities, but we have also, can anybody explain this time we're in? I don't like, I have no concept of time. Um, admittedly, like I thought this thing was supposed to be for tomorrow, but I'm really glad I was reminded because like, I knew it was earlier in my week, but like today is Monday. Let mm -hmm. that be a PSA. Today is Monday, July 20th. Um, so time is still going on as it does, but it's relative. And in a way we had, we still have all these other projects on the back burner that we can like bring up and clean up some scores and yes. And maybe even make things better if need be, mm -hmm. um, like my piccolo part in my piece, because that is a definite hot mess. Um, yeah, very cool. Um, and I'm loving this leaning in. Yeah, go ahead, Laura. I guess, yeah, on that note, because, yeah, that was my post. Sorry for the whole confusion of us having the same name. Um, but, yeah, yeah. Um, this is also like the longest place I ha longest time I have been in one place and specifically here because I haven't lived here since I like went to college in 2011 for this long. So I, usually I'm like on the go between several different locations, but now I've just been like literally in a house. And yeah. that is weird. 
Understood. Absolutely understood. Um, anyone else have anything to say? Like any ideas of things you've done the past four months? Oh my gosh. Well, I, I have to like, I feel like I need to take a tally, like put it in the wall, except I don't own this house and my cats are better at destroying furniture than I am. But yeah. Um, any things you've done with like creations? Uh, it sounds like some of us have picked up different hobbies that maybe we might carry outside of the pandemic. Like you got to feed that sourdough starter. You got to feed it. Um, yeah, Julian, what's up? So this is a little specific to conducting, but when I got home, the week I got home, I just like studied Tchaikovsky symphonies for a week. It was wild. Um, but I actually did a lot of that. That's, that's a very big thing for conductors, just like being a hermit and studying scores. But I actually think it can help any kind of creative just to like study the equivalent of scores, I guess, um, in whatever field. Even if you can't physically do it at the moment, um, it was, it's good to learn stuff, I guess. That being said, it's been four months and I started getting a little tired of that. So that's why I started getting into stuff like Z-Fest. That's awesome um, that you got into Z-Fest. Nice plug there. Um, actually, um, I found this new app because um, I miss going to the library, right? Uh, because that's something I've learned as a composer that like, as much as I'd love to like use my credit card, although my credit card has been used to buy gear but book like scores are also gear. Also you need bookshelves for them. Have you all heard of the Encoda app? Oh my goodness. It's like yes. all these scores. Oh my God. I'm gonna force my students to get it. I actually asked the librarian on my campus. I'm like, can we all have like an institution wide Encoda? Um, yeah, um, because I had a friend, a friend and I are also, uh, were into um, the Philip Glass opera Akhenaten and, you know, um, like saw it on PBS and whatnot. Um, it turns out there's even the individual parts to the Akhenaten score on Encoda. And this person's like, I may or may not play the trombone part along with it. I'm like that, that is like supreme nerddom, but, but you do it. But um, I would encourage you all to look that up because score studying is a thing. Um, and it has some pretty modern scores um, that has been great in this time of pandemic. Um, you know, granted, if you're like tired of scores, maybe I guess you make bread or something like that. Um, or you can teach me conducting because that's something I was looking forward to getting. Like I was like, I'm going to learn to conduct and I'm going to sign up for some things and womp womp cannot. And uh, the most I can do if I were to conduct anything would be my cats. But right now I'm kind of into like making weird electronic noises and just seeing my cats would do this. So, but I don't know if that'll sustain my attention for that long. That's just a thing. Um, anyways, so I think I'll take, there's a question here um, that Corey asked, uh, benefits of being part of a composer collective. Ah, yes. Actually, there are all different types of composer collectives. This is something that I've seen pop up before the pandemic and actually it's been going on for a long time. So um, I would say that I am, yes, I'm in Blue Dot and the, the advantage is we have a mission statement and that we're gonna like write pretty much educational music. It does have a band spin on it. And what's great is like, I have a group of friends that kind of have like the same goals and we try to promote each other. Um, we recently did a, a WASB World Association symphonic bands and ensembles, yay. Um, so we, we were able to get online and talk about like, I guess um, how it is to be a, a band composer. I may have said band whore on that little forum there, but um, it's good to have like, especially again, you don't create things in a vacuum. Um, I definitely, if I'm writing my band pieces, I write for this group of colleagues and friends because it's great to bounce ideas from them. So, um, and what was also most beneficial for that specific collective was that uh, we usually go to Midwest Clinic, um, which is like a big wind ensemble thing. Um, canceled <laughs> or it's online now, um, probably because McCormick Center is literally an ICU unit. I'm just gonna throw it out there, like where our boots would be um, are now hospital beds. It's just what it is, we're changing it. Um, but the, the main advantage is like booths at Midwest are really expensive. So we just split it up. Um, 
now we just need to get an intern to, to do the booth for us. So if you're a young aspiring composer and if there's gonna be a Midwest soon, hit me up because um, we would like to help out young composers, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, I would, I would actually encourage you all to do them and think of it like a, um, a band, not like a wind ensemble, but like a group of people. And, you know, bands evolve and change over time. Sometimes they break up, sometimes they last forever. Um, my friends, Kinds of Kings, recently two members left, but I think it's because of geographical things. So um, maybe in the time of COVID, it might encourage you all to like expand your reach because we're able to all hang out at the same time, just hopefully not at like 3 a.m. times. Um, but I, I just always would say that it's good to have a group of collective creative minds that are on the same wavelength that you can bounce ideas off of. This is always a good thing. It falls under the whole like, find your people, right? Um, find your friends, find who you want to like create things with. Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, does anybody have any questions to follow up with that? Because I think you could just form one, unless you were led, let's say the American Composers Forum, that is actually Composer Collective, but it's like at a national level. It used to be like Minnesotan level, now it's like a little bit bigger. And it's like a 501c3. Yeah, go ahead. Can I ask you the very broad question of how does one go about forming one of those? Um, like what does the you know, look like? Okay, so technically I've never experienced the beginning. I was asked to join a couple of them. I'm also part of the um, Adjective Collective. Um, I think what both of them did, so for Blue Dot, Ben wanted to form a group that was like another similar group to create band music. So I think he started asking people. So my friend Viet was like, literally got a phone call and explain what the mission statement was. And would you like to be a part of it and think about it? Like there was no contract involved. Um, I was one of the later members to come on to Blue Dot. Um, I think they all wanted to meet me. And since we're all over the place, we just did it via Skype. I was like, cool, speed dating, let's, let's get this going. But like, I think it worked out because there was a mission statement. Honestly, there was like a reason why y'all got together. Does that make sense? So um, yeah. I would highly encourage you all, if you wanna start your own composer collective, like to make it official, um, besides like a website and all that stuff, I would say, what is your focus? Like, why do you all wanna get together in form a group? I think that's very important. Um, I've seen other composer collectives where they're not quite sure and then they break up over time because they're not quite sure what their intention is. So like, if you look up Blue Dot, there's a mission statement. If you look at Kinds of Kings, there's a mission statement just to really focus on your purpose of being together. And um, yeah, I'd say ask your composer friends or maybe it's like a perform composer performance collective, right? Maybe it's something stylistic. Maybe you notice that um, you and a few other people have the same stylistic thing. There's just got to be some kind of unifier that helps bring you all together and keep you all together. That's that's what I would highly recommend. Um, anything else? Since I'm I'm still here a little bit. Um, I'm assuming that you all are trying to, you, you all are doing things, obviously you're part of the festival. Um, mentally hope you're doing okay. It's okay to have down days. Um, I told myself it was okay to take naps all the time. <laughs> Actually naps are great. Um, anyways, bye Alexa, thanks for coming. I know you have to go. Um, and she, Seamus was gonna mention Encoda. I can't, I can't tell you how much I love the app. Um, I have a very inappropriate way of explaining how much I love the app. I'm not going to say it. It has to do with like a Saturday Night Live bit. Let's just say I'm extremely excited about the Encoda app. And I look forward to like getting to know scores. The last three weeks have been a little chaotic. Um, let's see. I've been trying to take naps. You know what? I'm going to get rid of the stigma that to be productive, you have to wake up at a certain time. A lot of my friends are like, oh my goodness, I'm like sleeping until like noon and I don't go to sleep later. And I'm like, is that really bad? 
unless you literally have to show up to a job or you literally have to log on. I'm serious. I'm absolutely serious. Sorry. I'm like going to get on a rant. I didn't mean to get on rants, but like I teach like a really early theory class in the morning. And I know that all of my freshmen are at the stages of their growth development where um, they're more attuned to learning at like 11 AM. So as a professor, I'm like, are you even retaining this information because you should be sleeping? Yeah. The answer is no. Sorry. And I can't control this because it's bigger than me, by the way, by Corey. Thanks again for coming. Um, but I would say that if you don't take naps and that's your thing, awesome too. You do you. I, I think that's one thing. Yeah. Go ahead, Laura. Can I just say that 8 a.m. your training as a freshman was a time? Because yeah, I, I still all, yeah. I just like low enough to begin with. So I was just like, hello, I am a tenor. Hi. I mean, you're technically not because I have a lot of senior friends and I did take voice lessons because I was like, I want to write an opera. Okay. So I know something about that. However, I do know that your voice is lower in the morning and that I've had senior friends who have to, let's say if they're singing early for an Easter service, because that's what pays the bills. Um, they had to get up really early to warm up their voices. Anytime mm -hmm. they had some kind of school outreach where like the kiddos were up now, kiddos, like young children, bless them. They are up and about. They do not have like the same like chronotype as teenagers, right? Um, so anyways, I would just hope that you all are getting some sleep. I know that's actually really hard right now because we're all anxious. I don't know about you, but I've had some really disturbing dreams and I'd rather not remember them. So I've started taking these really special gummy bears at night. I'm not a doctor or I am, but I'm the wrong type in this situation. So just so we're clear, I don't prescribe anything. But um, I hope you all are staying mentally healthy, well, um, that it's good to do like journaling or if you all ever heard those morning pages where you just like get up and you just write literal crap that comes from your brain and then you just put it away. It's actually a great exercise. Um, walking, even though for the first part of the pandemic, I was very much against it because somebody was telling me to get up and walk and I'm like, no. I'm my own person, I make my own decisions. I should have some control over something in my life. The walks are not bad, but I'm not forcing you to do that. So anyways, any other questions, any other thoughts about like what we talked about, about like who we write for, why we exist as creatives, um, how we're gonna adapt? I was kind of wondering, um, since it's kind of like the Z-Fest thing, um, like we talked so much about what we've lost in the pandemic times and everything. I was wondering like we could talk more about sort of like what we've done to adapt and like how, how to do that in a virtual space, which like, I guess we kind of talk about all the time. So I don't know. I was just wondering if you had any ideas about that um, and we can talk a little bit about what we've been doing, but it's probably pretty clear what we've been doing so yeah um i mean i've been doing more like um zoom things like i i'm actually restructuring how like um how i'm going to be teaching my computer music class in the fall like i think they're just going to do a fixed media piece and then do like a live thing um i have been doing more electronics because why not right like why not do more electronics um yeah online rehearsals i don't know how those are going but that, that seems like a thing um i think that also um i feel like i'm tapping into another part of my creativity as to like how to adjust my pieces seriously like i want to do this to help out younger ensembles at the same time it is forcing me to really figure out my counterpoint and it's forcing me to figure out like my phrasing and my motives and even um <laughs> please no see sound um, which sorry for the record i had a computer science colleague or he, he prefers cs colleague who's like c sound is really cool he's like as a programmer i don't understand how some of this like fuzzy programming works it shouldn't work this way and it's odd but i was like yeah um anyway um but just more like <sighs> taking more walks and really listening to the sounds around me you know just really trying to be in the moment there um what else have I done? What else have we done um, besides Zooming and stuff like that? And creating more, like I'm trying to cook more. In fact, I have to cook dinner tonight. That's what I'm doing, so. <laughs> have you done any like recorded stuff? Like, like a lot of what we're doing here is like a lot of pieces written for, um, you know, everybody recording on a click track or whatever. 
but mm -hmm. like have you done anything like that and like I guess how would you adapt music to to work in that context yeah so um I haven't done that yet but I will and I'll tell you how um one of the things that um especially for younger ensembles is again there's no we don't know what's going to happen and not only do we not know what's going to happen but everybody has a different plan based on even what school district you're in. It's not even state by state, which is like different in itself. And so one of the things I was talking with some of my friends is that um, even something with like a young, large ensemble piece, that it's good to have a pre-recorded track so that they're not playing by themselves, right? Because it's scary to play by yourself. Um, and in fact, the difficulty level of any of these like wind ensemble pieces like skyrockets as soon as you have like a chamber setting or if it's, if it's exposed, it's like way difficult. So first thing is like some kind of track and I need to make that for one of my older pieces. I'm thinking to just go like weird sound electronics because like I don't even want to try to synthesize what we should be hearing. I think this is a good opportunity to creatively put in some weird sounds that are tonal enough so they're not playing by themselves but they also need a click track and in fact we were discussing about like how it's even important for the composer themselves that says all right we're about to play this piece you're going to hear four clicks and then you begin playing so that they have every single support group of like this is how you create music together and also by yourselves just to help out everybody so um again i haven't done that yet I will be doing a click track soon um, for this piece that I'm reworking because we don't know what we're going to get. But um, yeah, so that's changed my audience a little bit. Like not only is it for kids, but it's for now kids play them by themselves if they need to, but also still playing with their colleagues if they need to. And also hoping that they don't get tired or bored because they're children. So um yeah, I, I hopefully that answers the question. Um, I should like give you all an update to see how that goes. And I have to admittedly, I've never made a click track before, but now is the time. So I'll be Googling that. I can still learn new things, even though I'm almost middle-aged, it's possible. Um, and then does actually, does anybody have a suggestion on the timbre of the click track? Like what's the best one? Is it like a wood block? Is it just a click or? Yeah, Laura, you I know your dog's been growling but it's okay it's like gone in and out of the room three times during this zoom chat so that's also a whole time but um yeah anyway um well what i did is i just used the d default that sibelius has um okay. and like muted everything else and had the click going and just bounced that and very easy to do however um for rehearsal purposes, my ensemble asked me to like say the measure number like every 10 measures or so, which I need to like edit out some of that still just to just as like a final thing to make things a bit easier. Um, mm -hmm. Slightly pre preoccupied with this 48 hour challenge, but I'll be on it later today. Um, yeah. So yeah, just like say, um, the measure number every like 10 measures or so just so that they don't have to like do the whole thing from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked uh, smart music. Yeah, that's a huge thing. And it's still a thing. Um, I don't personally know how it works. I knew that when I was writing a younger piece of music, the one that I'm actually adapting now, they're like, can I have the Sibelius file to, to put it into smart music? I'm like, okay, cool. And then I was trying to get more of my stuff because like it's helpful. And it's especially if like the kids have muggle parents and they don't know how to help them practice, you know, it is a good tool. Um, I know that also recently I've seen conductors do this where it's like they're conducting. So instead of a click track, they video themselves conducting so that then the, the student or the ensemble member can play along. I think that's what happened with like the interlock. And so they had their Le Prelude last night and Christian Marcelo like was conducting. And then I guess they did a composite, which was quite amazing um, since all of the students had to use click track. And I saw like a tiny guy with the trumpet. It was like, he was so tiny. He almost looked like he was playing like a trombone or something like that. It was just, you know, but it brings people together, but it is different. So I, I feel like maybe instead of a click track, definitely to do the conducting thing I've seen. 
Well, I've never done that. Um, see, I've had a conductor conduct and then someone mapped a click track over for one track. Yeah. So I know there's like a lot more work involved, um, but I think we're coming together to do it. Yeah, I'm seeing some head nods like, you know, and here I thought I was done too. Somebody was like, it's good that you put a little piano part so the conductor can maybe play and fill in voices, but not actually fill in voices. But um, can you add some like chords on top because their main instrument might be guitar. And I'm like, this piece will never end, but it was done. But, uh, you know, again, it's something we need to do because our audience has just changed a little bit. But, you know, at the same time, I take comfort in knowing that this will expand my audience, or at least I hope so, or at least it better because I'm spending a lot of time <laughs> doing this extra work. Um, I even created a, um, or I adapted a um, improv piece, but I had to add more instruments to it. And I think now is a great time to, um, for ensembles to embrace improvisation and real-time composing and creating, um, which is something that like educational, music educational standards have been promoting for like decades, right? Or at least the last couple of decades. And they're like, we don't know how to fit it in. I'm like, well, we have to improvise everything now because we still don't know what's happening. So now, now's the time. And then um, I, I kind of was like, okay, this piece will work. It's improvisatory, it has cells. It was originally an electronics piece. I'll just give them some bass clarinet tracks, you know, ask my friend, pay her if that's what she wants or she should get paid, I think. Um, but my goodness, hiding those stems, that was, whew, that was a lot of work, right? So like, I, I know that a lot of the things that we'll have to do to adjust is going to take work. We all know this, right? It's gonna take a lot of time, but I, I would like to think it's worth it. It's kind of like anything that's like valuable in our society and like, to, to kind of go in the social justice area. Like this isn't gonna fix itself overnight, right? Our, our pieces aren't gonna adapt overnight, but like for the greater good, we need to like put the work in. Cause this is something that's been needed for a long time, actually. I would say more improvisation. Um, a lot of ensembles aren't standard, especially with younger groups. I would even say as someone who used to work at a liberal arts school, like, you get, you get students who are like wanting just to do it for the love of playing their instrument. You know what I'm saying? So I had to think of like, is my audience a professional musician? Here, no, but maybe it's somebody like, maybe it's a student who just really wants to keep playing. So yeah, let's see. What do I think will be techniques that will carry over even after things become normal? Uh, I think virtual performances are here to stay. Uh, because it'll add exposure and it actually, as we've discussed earlier, um, our reach is a little bit broader. Um, Cause even something like live streaming, uh, even my parents bless them and they are muggles. Like you'd not believe um, they're, they actually kind of get excited. They're like, Oh, this is what you do. Cause I think they're still trying to figure out of like, you know, parents, they, they think they know what you do. But they don't quite know what you do. And um, I think, I think my dad knows what I do, but y'all, y'all get what I'm talking about. So I think that the virtual performances will still say the same. Um, I do think adjusting instrumentation, I think chamber music is going to have definitely more of a comeback. You, it sounds like you guys mostly create chamber pieces, but I'm just noticing for composers who've had more larger ensemble things, it's going to be smaller and more adaptable. Um, I do think the whole DIY thing, um, probably started a little bit before uh, COVID, but like the the composer performer is very important. So I think what I liked about all of y'all's 48 hour challenge is that y'all had to do everything. And that, I think we're gonna be doing that for a very long time. Very, very, very long time. So instead of being like, be a specialist, you should be able to do a few things pretty well. Um, Let's see, what else? Uh, what do you think will be, um, or techniques? Well, yeah, like I said, different instrumentation. Probably, um, I would say stylistically, I wonder if we're gonna have to get away from the timbre that we want. Maybe the timbre will come from like electronic sources, something that's like, can be used in conjunction with live performances. That's what I'm thinking just because we won't have as big of an ensemble for a while. Um, yeah, so. Um, this might be a tangent in relation to that, um, but 
we I feel like a lot of the things we obsess over in classical education, especially at the collegiate level, is timelessness of music. You want to be like Beethoven and have your music last forever. But hopefully there's some part of it I feel like the pandemic will last forever. But there's the hopeful part of me that says that it will end. And wouldn't that make the timelessness of the music we're creating to adapt to this irrelevant? But then again, does that matter? And did it ever matter? And do you think maybe we'll move past it once and for all? Um, it, the timelessness? Okay, so personally, I remember when I was an undergrad, yes, I remember hearing that lesson pretty indirectly, but I'll be all the time. And um, yes, that's a great Nina Simone quote. And I'll tell you why. Um, is the duty of an artist to reflect their time. I realized that pieces that kind of stood the test of time were not only good pieces, but more importantly, it spoke to them. It was meaningful for them and they were reacting to the time. So um, one thing that I noticed in actually John Cage's piece, Four Minutes and 33 Seconds, did you all know that he wrote a piece prior to that called Silent Prayer? Yeah, so he was lecturing, uh, I forget where, I wanna say a women's college. No, it was one of those like small liberal arts New England schools. So there goes my doctor poof, I guess I should know this, but I forgot. Okay, um, and he proposed that people, um, it was like specifically a piece, he wanted people to write a, a piece of silence for the Muzak company. And he wanted, I feel like it was like a protest piece. He wanted everybody to send in a pop music links clip to the music company to be submitted, to be considered as part of the music that they played. Um, because at that time, um, our concept of like hearing music in public was very different. Um, we're used to hearing music in the grocery stores. We're used to hearing music in our malls um, when I used to work in retail. And if somebody like decided to come 10 minutes before closing, we weren't supposed to do this, but we would cut the sound because it would make them feel nervous. And we're like, get out. Cause we had to like close up and count money and like, arena. you know what I'm saying? Like, we're like, why are you even trying to shop at eight, nine 50 PM? Get out. You know, okay. So sorry. Um, but we're used to hearing canned music all the time. Um, and in fact, I feel like sometimes we might even be jonesing for like music in our car. It used to not be that way. And the music company, was kind of building up in prominence. And there was this whole other thing where the, like music would make your workers more productive. You know, and there's this whole other thing about that. Well, John Cage hated it. And actually a lot of Americans were like, how can you like force music on us? Music should be listened in our own time and we can't even select the music. So I think he was a little pissed about that. And he wrote, he, he, he talked about the silent prayer piece. So I think he was like a protest. It's like all of us, send in silence so that they play like eight hours of silence or something like that. Um, about a year later, that's when he came up with the concept of four minutes and 33 seconds, which again, he's been dabbling in silence and the concept of that a little bit before that piece. But I also thought he was pissed. So like, I kind of think, I'd like to think that like John Cage was kind of like going on of like kind of forcing us to listen to what's around us and also giving us agency of what we're listening to. So um, now that piece, I know we've all learned about it. Um, I kind of roll my eyes sometimes when um, it's taught in class because it's like, what is it? It's, it's like a great pedagogical tool as to what is music, but like, I don't know. I feel like he was writing music at the time. Um, I also think of Stravinsky's Symphony of Psalms and he wrote it for the Boston uh, Symphony Orchestra. It's religious, right? But his wife was really sick at the time. And so he was like trying to find texts to kind of like console himself, but it's like known for being a really good piece of music. And so um, I don't like that sometimes schools will say like, we'll write music that lasts because I think the focus is like misguided a little bit. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that, um, yes, I do also feel Andrew that like, I don't know when this COVID time is going to end. It's been a time I'm like getting tired. Like I feel like my stamina of being a good citizen and masking up, like I just, it's, it's starting to get at me. Right. Like, and I'm an introvert here. I'm like, yes, time to stay in. And now I'm like, but I just, I just want to go to a restaurant and I just want to drink a cocktail and I want to be, I, I just want I just want to know what like the sun is, even though I know perfectly well what the sun is. And I know that it will turn my skin into leather and light me on fire because I live in Lubbock, Texas. But um, 
I would, I would hope that they wouldn't focus on like meaningful music. I would more actually, this is a little bit of a tangent on your tangent. Um, we need to reevaluate what type of music's being taught, I even think, and like other voices and hearing other voices. And also with the internet and with things we gain from that, like Zoom, we're able to reach more people and also hear from other people. So um, anyway. Yeah, um, I, I think I created that tangent because I feel like we're, we're, we're kind of talking to ourselves about being like, oh, this is how we have to adapt. And we're all nodding hands like, yeah, of course we have to adapt. That's why we're at Z Festival. And, um, and but we also have institutionalized stuff uh, and structures in place that are supposed to be teaching us these things and haven't been. And so, um, and they're probably reluctant to because they're all crossing their fingers, hoping they can survive until things go back to normal. And um, I don't believe things will go back to normal. And I wonder, in 10 years, if I look back on the 2020 me and be like, oh, naive, naive Dewey thought that things were going to end. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know if it's naivety. I think it's just like we were mentioning earlier that adapting our pieces takes a lot of work and click tracks take a lot of work. I think there's a resistance to making the change and working at it. Like even something like diversifying your curriculum or decolonizing your curriculum, that's going to take a lot of effing work, like a lot. And it's such an understatement. Like that means, that means people who are not used to finding examples for their students, like me, I'll, 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 I'll admit that sometimes like I just want to teach a theory concept. I'll go to music theory.net. I'll go to music for women. Although I can't hit that up until like more chromaticism because like, I can't teach someone who just learned scales about Amy beach. Like that would be a disaster. Right. Um, but it, it's like, I want to like write music or like, I want to do my research and it's a theory class. Right. So it's like, I don't think it's that we can go back to normal. I think we all know it's not going to go back to normal. Even, even after the September 11th attacks, we're not flying the same way as we used to, right? In fact, I was actually watching an old Office episode, which was post 9-11, and I'm like, how did Pam get into the airport? Like, does she have a ticket? Like, I was like, how is this even possible? Um, you know, but it's changed and we're adapting to it. We are definitely grumbling about it. I still grumble when I have to like go through security. Uh, I know I'm safer. Um, I hope I don't like that. My instrumentalist friends have to deal with like TSA that sucks. And I hope that changes, but like, you know, I, it would be very naive of us to think that things are going to go back to normal. They will not, and I'm not even an expert on that. Like, there's just no way. Things have already changed, and some good things have happened from it, and we're having good conversations. So, yeah, I'm. I'm also very curious as an academic, as a professor person, how this is how this is going to affect things. I'm very curious, and I too have to be the change. So, like, I will have to spend a lot more time thinking of my theory curriculum. I have some ideas, and now I'm like. I wonder if the times have made it so that I'm like, I have no more Fs to give. So I might as well just like do it. We'll see. We'll see if I still have a job. I don't know. No. Well, with that, I think um, it's probably a good time to get off YouTube. Um, I know, Jennifer, you have a project coming up. I'm not sure if you wanted to plug that on YouTube before we. Uh, oh, yes. Off. Thank you for that reminder. So speaking of times, and speaking of things that, um, ways of adjusting, um, me and a couple of composer friends have a, a composer, um, for lack of a better word, not a boot camp, but um, let's, oh, you're gonna laugh when I share this. So not the 48 hour challenge, but um, the composer's field guide. <laughs> So we're doing a mini course that admittedly we hope we never do again because we hope that COVID never happens again. Um, but we're like, here's a time. Um, if you uh, want to, um, if you are a young composer or identify as a young composer, this is an opportunity where you take lessons from me, my friend Danny Felsenfeld, and my friend JL Marlor. We have a couple of composer guest speakers and we have a couple of miniature ensembles people who live with each other because it's COVID times who could read through your work so um, my friends transient canvas will be doing this thing um, as you can see the website is called is composersfieldguide.com 
Um, and if you have any questions about that, you can certainly hit me up on any of the social medias. Um, I am at Jen Jolly with two N's and an EY at the end, or on Instagram as Y Compose, or I'm on Facebook. You could just Google me. It's not hard. Um, and ask me any questions about that. But I'm really excited because it's, you know, this example of us coming together and making something happen. So those are the dates. Um, it's not super jam packed, which I like because, um, like I said, I just got done teaching interlocking and that's like super jam packed for like, I get, but middle schoolers, I guess, need to be occupied in more ways than we are. So thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Of course. And thank you so much for being here, Jen. We really appreciate your talk.